Good morning. <clears throat> and welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Christian Marquardt. Glad to have the opportunity to worship with all of you here today. As Christians, we want to make sure that we don't put angels um, in a place where they don't belong. Angels are not God. We don't pray to them or honor them in the same way, and yet we can give thanks to them. Many Christians have been comforted and encouraged by knowing that they have guardian angels, by knowing that God sends angels to watch over them. And uh, so today we have a special day to give thanks for God's service among us, which does include angels. By the time of the Lutheran Reformation, uh, the church calendar had been full. Every single day there was some sort of festival, some sort of feast, some sort of worship opportunity giving thanks and in memory of somebody. Um, when Martin Luther and the other reformers um, cleared out the church calendar, they got rid of almost all of those festivals. They said all of these are a distraction from God. And they kept this one, though. This is the Feast of St. Michael and all angels. And today, in our worship, we're going to give thanks that God sends angels and sends servants to oppose the devil and to oppose his work. That'll be the focus of our worship this morning. We're going to get started with our opening hymn. That's hymn number 499, Christ the Lord of Hosts Unshaken. You'll find the words displayed on the screen. They're also um, in the middle of the hymnal that you'll find in your pews, and it's in the St. Michael and All Angels section, which I bet you didn't know existed until today. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen.
Our worship continues on page three in the service folder. The words are also displayed on the screen. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted in a wonderful order the ministries of angels and mortals. Mercifully grant that as your holy angels always serve and worship you in heaven, so by your direction they may help and defend us here on earth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. 
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 6. We have enemies. We know that we have enemies from the time that we were little children playing on the playground. We realized that we had enemies. As we grew older, entered into schools and universities, we realized again that we had enemies. As we made it into the workplace, found ourselves competing with others, we realized that we had enemies. As our relationships with our families either improved or declined, we realized once again that even in our own families, sometimes we have enemies. We know that we have enemies, but we have something even more powerful than that. We have our God who is watching over us. Our God sends powerful angels to protect us and to stand by our side. And here in the Old Testament, God's people were once again reminded and even shown visually, God's servants are protecting you. A reading from 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is the word of our God. Amen. Our worship continues with the anthem from our choir.
Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 12. This section talks about the role that Michael played. He contended against Satan. He opposed the devil as one of God's angels. Then right after that, we hear about the way that God's people triumph over the devil. And we, it's not right for us to say we triumph over the devil because of the angels. That's not quite right. When it's described the way that the people triumphed over Satan and triumphed over death, it wasn't because God sends angels to protect us, although we're very thankful for that. We triumph over them by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony that he has given us to declare with power that Jesus Christ lives, Jesus has overcome death, and the work of Jesus has destroyed the work of Satan, and through him we are victorious. A reading from Revelation 12, beginning at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Our worship continues as we join in singing our next hymn. That's hymn number 500, Lord God, to you we give all praise. And once again, it's in the St. Michael and All Angels section.
The text for our consideration this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. The reading begins at verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. I like the fourth stanza of that hymn that we just sang, the end of it, noting that what Satan loves to do is to divide us, to cause division within God's people. And it's a reminder that we want to know who our true enemy actually is. I listened to a sermon from another Wells pastor, so, I mean, it wasn't as good as mine, but. (laughs) From another Wells pastor, um, and he talked about, he talked about who our real enemy is. And if you watch TV, or if you open your mailbox, you'll find, oh, I have enemies, and they are trying to oppose the way I live. This is one of the problems of being in one of the seven states that can decide a national election. You just get bombarded with news, always bad news, about how the world's going to end. The devil would have us believe that our enemies are somebody other than him, but our enemy is the devil. And we want to remember that. The devil is real. And as Jesus was carrying out his ministry, the devil's work was very apparent. There were people who were demon-possessed. It happens repeatedly throughout Jesus' ministry. There was a man who was demon-possessed, a woman who was demon-possessed, a child who was demon-possessed. Jesus is carrying out his ministry as the devil's work is right there, right in front of our faces. It's a little bit harder to tell that today. Additionally, We want to know who our enemy is because that way we know how to oppose him and how to be victorious over him. Martin Luther wrote a lot about who the devil is and what the devil is doing. He wrote repeatedly, if you spend much time reading anything that he wrote, he says, the devil is opposing me, I know it. I can't see the devil, but I know he's trying to stop me. He wrote a lot about the Pope, too, for those of you who are interested in the Pope, which is understandable because even today the Pope recently said things like, Um, All religions are paths to God. It's a quote from Pope Francis. Whereas we would say, no, (laughs) Jesus is the path to God. Jesus is the way to heaven. And actually, Jesus is the way for us to be victorious over Satan. So we need to know that. We have to know who our enemy really is. And as the disciples went out and carried out their ministry, they even had the ability to cast out demons. Would you like that? I would like that. I wish I could do that. Actually, I'm not sure. I would like the ability to do it. I just don't know that I want to be involved in it. It was about, um, about six months ago, here at St. James, a pastor presented, Pastor Jim Aderman. We might have, you might have heard him preach before, but he presented on work that he's done being involved in exorcisms. That's right, The Exorcism isn't just a bad movie from the 70s. Um, Exorcisms still continue to happen today. People are still possessed by spirits today. It's not maybe as commonplace as it was back when Jesus was walking the earth, but it happens. And he talked to us pastors about what that's like and how you can be involved and how you can oppose the devil. It's important for you to know. It's important for me to know. It's important for us to remember that we have an enemy who isn't a person, who isn't just some political figure, who isn't somebody who can be defeated so easily as clicking a little button or pulling a lever or filling in a box. We have an enemy who is not so easily defeated as taking your phone and turning it off, as disconnecting from the internet, as closing your front door. We have an enemy who is the devil, and he is a spiritual force who has been alive ever since God created him, and ever since he went wrong, and yet you can be victorious over him. And so, since you can, we've got to figure out how you can, and how I can, and how we can, how we can have hope, even knowing that we have enemies that oppose us. 
These, this brief section starts out with the 72. At the beginning of Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples. He sent them out two by two to every town and place where he was about to go. Jesus is preparing the people, saying, Jesus is coming to town. I'm going to send my disciples ahead of the way, telling them that the kingdom of God is here. And as they went and prepared the way for Jesus, as they carried out ministry, Part of what they did was, apparently, cast out demons. They returned with joy, and they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. And that's a big deal. Because if we read through the Gospels, we find out that sometimes there were demons, and the disciples didn't know what to do. People came after Jesus. They said, Jesus, please, my daughter is demon-possessed. I asked your disciples to help, but they couldn't. They weren't able to. They didn't know the right thing to say. If you've watched any movies about demons or about the devil, you know that there's some kind of ceremony that you have to perform. You have to get out some kind of salt, some kind of water. You have to have a book probably written in Latin. You have to read it. There's some kind of incantation you have to read. You have to know the right combination of words. Otherwise, the devil will not be convinced to leave. Otherwise, the spirits will not know that they are not welcome there anymore. This time, when they're carrying out their ministry, they said, the, the demons submit to us in your name. Well, that sounds important. What was it that they were doing here that the disciples didn't understand previously? Well, what they figured out is the name of Jesus is powerful. The demons have to submit to the name of Jesus. The devil has to submit to the name of Jesus. When we heard that section from Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the people who triumphed over the devil. How did they do it? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of his testimony. Something about our connection with Jesus gives us the ability to triumph over evil spirits. And Jesus explains here what that is. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And it, this is at least the third time that this has happened. Way back when, can't tell you when it happened exactly, but way back when, when God created the world, when he made everything, one of the things he made was angels. And some of the angels decided that they didn't like being told what to do. They decided to rebel. One of them was Satan. And so when God was against Satan, who do you think won? It wasn't Satan. He was kicked out, thrown down to earth. In Revelation 12, we have a picture of once again war happening in heaven. And the devil once again loses because he always loses. And he's thrown out. And the thing that's referred to when the, when the people are victorious, when God's people are victorious over Satan, when he's kicked out of heaven again, what is the thing that's referred to? Well, Satan is called the accuser. If you've read through the beginning of the book of Job, you know at the very beginning, Satan is accusing Job. This guy's no good. He only likes you because he's rich. He's only happy to be with God because he's successful and has a big family and everything's easy. Take that away. He'll hate you, God. Well, Job lost everything and he didn't hate God. He was a little unhappy, but he didn't turn his back on God. Satan is an accuser. And what Satan loves more than anything is to convince you that you are worthless. Unlovable. God doesn't care about you. You're a failure. Not only does God not like you, but people around you don't like you. Your family doesn't like you. Your boss doesn't respect you. Nobody likes you because you're so evil and you're bad. The things that you do, if the people around you, if the people in this room knew what you actually did, they would never welcome you in the door. They wouldn't shake your hand. They wouldn't even smile at you. Those aren't my words, those are Satan's words, and you know those words because they've been in your head before. Did you know that that was the devil who said that? God didn't say that. That was what the devil said. 
The devil would be very happy for us not to just be aware that we are sinful, which is true, but to give up on any hope that anything good could ever change. The devil is very happy to have us in despair, to have us in doubt, to have us in fear, to have us terrified of dying because we don't know what it's like on the other side. And then there's Jesus. And Jesus gave his life for you. God's people triumph over Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus spills his blood for you so that you can be victorious over what Satan says about you. Satan says, God could never love you. God says, I do love you. I send my son for you. I die for you. I forgive you. Satan says, there's no way if God actually knew who you were that he would care about you. God says, I do know who you are. I know you're a sinner. That's why I sent my son for you, because I knew you needed that. I knew you needed forgiveness. I knew you needed salvation. That's why Jesus lived and died for you. And by you understanding that, you can be victorious over Satan too. Because he's going to come to you probably late at night as you're trying to fall asleep and fill your head with doubts. That's not just your subconscious talking. That's, just, that's not just you being embarrassed about things that you did when you were younger. That's the devil. And you can be victorious over those thoughts, over those intrusive thoughts, by saying, Jesus died for me. Jesus forgives me. So who is Satan to say anything about me? In fact, who am I to say anything about me? If God says that about me, if God gave his life for me, then I must be valuable, then I must be important, then somebody out there must care about me. God must. And when Jesus sent out the 72, when they walked in pairs two by two, I bet not all of them were great public speakers. I bet, not all, I bet not all of them were super empathetic to the people that they were caring for, and yet God sent him out anyway, and when they spoke the words of Jesus, he says, as if he saw their ministry taking place from afar, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When people got to hear the good news that the kingdom of God is here, that God loves them, that forgiveness is available to them, Satan is defeated all over again. It's just like the first day that Satan was kicked out of heaven. It's just like again when Satan loses over and over again. Satan's a loser. I want you to know that. Because Jesus is powerful over him. And because he is, so are you. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes. Going back to the book of Genesis the promise of a savior who would crush the serpent's head. I have given you that authority. Snakes and scorpions, I believe that's Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6. You can look it up, double check me. Please do that, Ezekiel 2, verse 6. Don't do it right now, but correct me afterwards if I'm wrong. Talking about scorpions, talking about the enemies of God's people, knowing that we are concerned about things beyond just physical scorpions. You can just walk around them unless you live in the Southwest, then they're everywhere. But knowing that there are spirits that oppose us, God says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And here he's not just talking about your body. He's caring about your soul. He says, if you're close to me, if you keep the blood of Jesus close to your heart, then nothing the enemy says can harm you. Nothing can hurt you. And if you are feeling hurt from the accusations of the enemy, then it could be that you need to pull the blood of Jesus closer once again and remind yourself and be reminded that he gave his life for you. Jesus is not saying he's commissioning all of us to go out as exorcists, to go out into the communities, to go knocking on the door for devils and spirits. He says, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's the unfortunate circumstance that people who have wonderful blessings from God can say, well, I have a blessing from God. 
God has given me some special gift or ability that somebody else doesn't have. In fact, I am the gift from God. Other people ought to be thanking me for what I'm able to do. If you and I can do anything, that comes from God. Satan's happy to oppose us in another way. He's happy for us to not have any trouble at all. And to think, you know what? I don't need God. In fact, I can replace God. He's happy to take you any way he can get you. Jesus says, don't rejoice in the gifts that you have, although if you have gifts, please use them. All of us benefit from that. But if you have gifts, don't rejoice that you have them, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Keep turning your attention back to Jesus, back to Jesus, back to Jesus, not looking in the mirror at yourself, not being concerned about what the devil says about you late at night or early in the morning or whenever you're there and have a moment. And as a parent, I can say sometimes you only have a moment or two by yourself to think just for once. That's when the devil gets you, any time, really. But whenever you have time to sit and think about this, remember what Jesus did for you. His blood covers you. His testimony is revealed to you. He is powerful. And he entrusts you with power too. So that you can overcome the enemy. And all of his attacks, all of his spiritual attacks, cannot harm you at all. You know your enemy. Go and fight him with the power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our worship continues as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed as our confession of faith. You'll find that on page five in your service folder. The words are also displayed on the screen. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We stand for prayer. O Lord of hosts, eternal, immortal, and invisible King, we praise and thank you for protecting your people through your holy angels, who always behold your face and worship your majesty. Grant, we pray, as you have commanded them to do your will, and to serve those who are the heirs of salvation, that they may also care for us, that we may be delivered from every peril of body and soul that threatens us. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to the people of all nations, O Lord. And since you will reveal your Son, Jesus, from heaven, with his mighty angels, to take vengeance on all who have denied you and rejected your love in Christ, Extend for the nations their time of grace, so that they might come to believe and live eternally. Use us as messengers of your gospel to penetrate the powers of darkness and to bring many to glory. Lord, in your mercy. Look on our own land with your favor. Give our citizens a love for what is true and right. Grant your blessing to all who have authority over us. Prosper our schools and colleges as they train many to proclaim your grace. Bless those who work with their minds and those who labor with their hands, so that all human work may benefit your holy church. Lord, in your mercy. Direct your holy angels to serve all who are in want, trouble, pain, sorrow, disappointment, anxiety, or any other trouble. Comfort them with your power and grace. Especially bless Kathy Begalke, who is mourning the loss of her husband, Jerry. Grant that your presence may brighten our homes, that children may learn of your tender love, and that all parents may walk in the counsel of your Son. Lord, in your mercy. May your holy angels serve you as they serve us, and at the end of our lives, lead them to carry us to the riches of paradise. Lord, in your mercy. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came as the light of the world, so that the world may have light and life through him. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith to life everlasting, that every evil attack of Satan may be thwarted, and you may have confidence of knowing that eternal life is yours. All of your sins are forgiven. You may live in peace. Amen. Amen. We stand for thanksgiving. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Once again, good morning, everyone. So uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to worship with you, to be reminded of the power that we have um, through our connection with Jesus. Several things to draw your attention to, stuff that we've got going on. Um, Sunday school is happening today. The assistance fund box is out on the table. There's information about what the assistance fund is in the bulletin, but this is a a way for us to help provide for members of St. James and sometimes members of the community who come in uh, needing some help. Additionally, um, after a brief, well, I don't know how long you think a hiatus is, but Bible study is happening here in the sanctuary today. It's going to be our look at um, Wisconsin and Missouri splitting, why that happened, um, and why they haven't come back together yet. You know, we're going to figure it out. Um, It'll be here at about 1040 um, in the sanctuary. Catechism is happening on Tuesday along with handbells and choir. I believe they're all, they're still open to new members too if you're interested in getting connected with one of our musical groups. 50 plus is happening on Wednesday. Community group is happening that evening. If you want more information, talk to me. Our executive board meeting is not on Friday. Um, Our executive board has a special meeting next Sunday. So those of you who are part of the executive board, remember we agreed to move our meeting to next week, Sunday. Um, The rest of it is in the bulletin and on the screen. I will greet you at the door. God's blessings on the rest of your Sunday.